Hello, I'm Philip Han Baker, and this is a small addendum to my last presentation, which is an elaboration on how to use their sequence to provide a zip archive type format and what the advantages of doing that would be for both um, traditional zip file type applications but also for software distribution and so, and so on. So when I design uh, protocols or whatever I always like to take existing stuff and back check, check them to, as a sanity check. And so, as I was designing their sequence, I was looking to see whether I could implement zip in their sequence, just to see whether their sequence was you know, made sense or not. And I, I did the same thing with HTTP. Actually, I mean, this is where HTTP POST uh, was redesigned because I was re-implementing this mail webmail system. Uh, the first one, as it turned out, uh, and we had a court case over that. Um, so somebody, and, and, and so basically we discovered a small problem with the HTTP protocol. Uh, you couldn't actually post a message using the HTTP post scheme as it was then defined, and that led to the introduction of content length into the HTTP spec. Okay, so zip file. What's wrong with zip? Well, not a great deal. It's just a bit old and the problem with zip is that encryption and authentication are both afterthoughts. So they're not reliably supported uh, and where they are supported the, the implications of that support differ wildly from one implementation to another. And it was also designed originally with a big focus on compression which was, you know, really important at the time that ZIP was first developed. But today, ZIP compression really isn't doing a lot for us. And the reason for that is that most of the time, what we're sending through uh, the web with ZIP or whatever is um, an archive consisting of one, maybe two or three text files and then an enormous number of JPEGs and PNGs and MPEGs and WAV. It's all stuff that is not compressible because it's already been compressed. You can't compress the compressed. So what we really need today is an updated version of TAR, which doesn't have compression, and put encryption and authentication into the core as core capabilities so that you can take an archive and efficiently select one item out of that archive and decrypt it, or validate that one archive item without the need to individually encrypt and individually sign each one. So, hence their sequence. So the ideal archive, what we would have is, we will ha have a sequ their sequence in which the first frame in the sequence, um, frame zero, has all the stuff that we need to decrypt. And then the last one has all the verification information and an index that gives us an immediate jump into any point in the file. And so we can do that pretty efficiently. If we already have all the files on disk, we can do that because the way that their sequence is uh, engineered, you can produce the next uh, element in the, the sequence with bounded buffering and all that great stuff, provided only that you know the length of the payload in advance. You don't need to know the actual content in advance. You, you don't need to buffer it all, but you do need to know the length. So we can provide that capability. Okay, so the, the various modes of creating archives, you know, typically with zip you create it all at once, but there's also an incremental form of using zip 
in that you can add a file into an existing container. And what's actually going on under the covers there is that if this is the right pointer, it moves the right pointer back so that we start writing over this last, so we erase this last record, we add our data, and then we append a new index to the end. And we can do that same mode in um, their sequence. And we can also use those delta indexes uh, or the Merkle tree type approaches that I described earlier. Uh, it all depends upon what your particular set of needs are. Uh, so we get a bit more flexibility. We can have the all at once, the incremental addition or the continuous addition with periodic fix-ups. So each entry in this sequence has a file path and of course we're not going to allow file paths that include the go up a directory uh, sequence because if you do that then what happens when somebody unpacks them somebody can create a poisoned archive that causes that user to overwrite their PGP keys or the SSH authentication file or whatever and laying themselves open to an attack. It has a content type, optional of course, but content type, creation date, modification and the decryption info or signature info if it happens to be different from the container as a whole. So you can do the signature encryption on the whole archive at once but you're not obliged to and you can always supplement. Okay, so we have a signature on the archive as a whole, which is created by signing the apex of the Merkle integrity tree. What that means is that we sign once and we get a signature for each entry in the archive. And that can be ver verified independently. Same, same exact thing for encryption. Okay, so what are the applications here? Well. One thing that I would like to see be able to do with this is to mount this uh, thing as a read-only file system mount and be able to mount it in Windows or Unix and so somebody can now send me a mesh archive with some confidential documents and I can mount it as a read-only disk in my operating system whatever and use the mesh to obtain whatever group encryption information assistance I need and you know do all that good stuff and so obviously to make that efficient you're going to need to make use of counter mode uh, block encryption you know, GCN and all that great stuff uh, but we can support random access to the data in that file if you want to go to write as well well in that case somebody's going to have to put some real effort in there you know, you've got to write, read, write, log, you know, you're basically doing a, a, a mountable um, file system that's log based and yeah, somebody would have to put some real effort into doing that. Uh, but we can, in, at least in principle, support the full read, write, mounts of Windows and Unix, give random access, even though this is an encrypted file system. And that's the reason that I'm not that interested in compression. This ability to just mount the container, sorry, mount the sequence as a file system is really quite attractive, I think. We can use this for pushing out web server content. So if we've got a sequence of uh, updates to our server, we can push them out by synchronizing their sequences again. So same way that we use for synchronizing catalogs uh, with the client and the mesh service, we can use the same ap approach to um, synchronize the author's copy of the website with the remote copy. And what this then gives us is a really nice uh, approach in that the point at which we, all we need to do to make the new version of the website go live is simply tell the server, bang, give the new stuff and what this means is that we can simultaneously serve out two different types of content you know we can give the very latest version the proposed update to the website can be 
exposed to the people with the appropriate access, while the public is seeing the other version of the website until the you know the website managers have checked, done all their sanity checking, they know that it's right, and then boom, one change, you know, all they need to say is move the read pointer back, and now we've gone live with the new version of the site in one atomic operation. Um, another thing that we could do this for is to provide a distribution format for a whole website or a single web page, uh, which is basically what WPAC is uh, looking at. Only the thing here is that WPAC is looking at integrity issues. I am looking at encryption and I want to be able to send uh, an encrypted version of my website to somebody and have them able to decrypt it but only if they've got the uh, right group decryption authorization and it's current. So I can do my meta encryption stuff as well. Another ap application for this archive that makes use of the atomic commit function with one operation. You know, that uh, atomic commit, it only needs to be a single write of a few hundred bytes to the sequence. Um, we can use it for software distribution. So we s distribute our software by synchronizing sequences. And they're signed, they're encrypted, and we've got this atomic update. Boom, go live with the new stuff. And so we can get away from that you know, really dreadful user experience we have today, where the user's asked, do you want to spend the you know the user comes up, you know wake up in the morning they open their laptop and the first thing this miserable thing is demanding is oh I would like to spend the next fifteen minutes updating myself you know downloading stuff from the internet well why can't you do that when I was uh, you know why can't you do that in the background you know why do I have to tell you to do it do everything so download everything in the background and if you must pester me then ask me at the point where you know you you ask me once do I want to go live with this new stuff and then just go live no I'm going to take your machine out of service for 15 minutes to two hours because the software developers just cannot be asked to do it right you know we have got to get away from that uh, style of programming it's not necessary we can do better. Okay, so atomic updates for software uh, update. Um, and okay, so so it's a fairly simple application of Dare Sequence. It doesn't add any real complexity to Dare Sequence itself. Every one of the features in Dare Sequence uh, that I needed for the to do this archive stuff would be required in another system and it does allow us to do a few things with this format that you can't with others. Oh one other thing that I did I should have mentioned is redaction. You can also redact the sequences. So say you've got a software distribution and you're using uh, you know you're using .NET or whatever and you have done the um, you know, the prepackaged compile to the major platforms. So uh, you have the just in time package, and then you've got the package for Intel processors, the package for OS X, the package for various types of Linux or whatever. And so all those, each of those executables is sitting there in the complete archive. And then when we synchronize the sequence, we can say, well, only gave me the pieces that are required for this particular platform. And the way that things are put together, we can still do our integrity checks and do everything else. It's not necessary to download stuff um, that you're not then going to use. So we've also got redaction in there. So a fairly straightforward approach to re-engineering ZIP and bring it into the 2020s, 
uh, use it or don't or look at it for inspiration or laugh at it or whatever. Uh, and in the next podcast, I'm going to be looking at mesh service and going ahead with the mesh presentations. So please join me there and please like and please subscribe because the more people we've got in this movement, the better chance we've got of convincing the Microsofts, the Googles, the Apples, the Mozillas and so on that it's time to have secure software on the internet and it's time to stop making security an afterthought. So thank you very much. Thank you.